we're going to um, hear from the various readers of the Apocalypse. Uh, the four readers were intended to be the four who wrote essays for particular rooms. Um, Aaron Rosen, uh, Natasha O'Hare, Michelle Fletcher, and Eddie Adams. But unfortunately, um, Natasha is not well today, so she can't be with us. And I'm going to um, pretend to be the fourth leader. Or maybe the fifth, if you were thinking by analogy with the horseman. There is this peculiarity, as many of you will have noticed, that, that the fourth horse, death, is described as having hell following with him. So maybe there are, in fact, five horsemen, unless hell is running very fast um, on foot. Um, some of our text experts may be able to comment on that. But I'll be hell anyway. <laughs> um, and take the place of Natasha, who would have been heaven, I'm sure. Um, what we'll do then is, um, is hear successively from Aaron, Michelle, then I'll say a few words in lieu of Natasha. And then at that point, we're going to pause and hear what the first of two responses from those who are familiar, very familiar as scholars with the text of, of the book of Revelation, but, um, but have come to the exhibition afresh without being part of the process that led to it. Um, the first is Dr. Simon Woodman, who I'll introduce um, later in this first section of the symposium. And then after tea, we'll be hearing from Professor Joan Taylor, who's a professor here at King's in uh, New Testament and Second Temple Judaism. So that will be the scholarly input. And then we're also very fortunate to have with us the artist, Michael Takio Magruder, and uh, the curator of the exhibition, Alfredo Cramarotti. And at various points, I'm going to invite them also to feed in to our discussions, to respond to what the readers uh, have said and the other respondents, um, and to make it into a conversation which I hope will include all of you as well. So we'll hear from the first three readers and then from Simon Woodman and then from Michael before we stop for tea. And then the second half, about 10 to 4, I'm going to invite Alfredo, the curator, to give his um, impressions of what it was to curate an exhibition like this. Um, and then we'll hear from the fourth reader of the apocalypse, Eddie Adams, and, and then hear our response from Joan Taylor. And at various points, as I say, I'll invite your, your contributions, your questions and thoughts. It is a very unusual exhibition, and one I think that we're all very proud of, because it's achieved that quite difficult thing, which uh, King's Cultural Institute was established precisely to do, and indeed the Inigo Rooms particularly, as an exhibition space, were established to do, which is to display the fruits of a genuinely integrated and highly interactive collaboration between research academics and artists and makers of various kinds. Um, and that's not something that necessarily either party is all that used to. Um, certainly for speaking as an academic, it's not something that necessarily we're trained with in our usual disciplinary training to work closely and think with artists. And part of the joy of the Cultural Institute and of the space is that it gives us both an invitation and a support structure to do that sort of thinking. Um, and in, in some ways to experiment with other kinds of thinking from the more uh, critical um, and in some way forensic work that uh, a lot of the time we, we do, and some way to think a bit more adventurously outside the particular limits of our discipline. So, um, so the challenge is significant, and, and Michael can comment from his side about what the challenges might be as an artist uh, in working with academics and what difference that has made to his artistic practice. But what I think we, we m managed to come to together in the form of this exhibition was something that was really genuinely the fruit of the conversations out of which it, it grew. It wasn't just that an existing piece of research then got, as it were, glossed by an artist, and nor was it the case that um, an exhibition that basically was already conceived in an artist's mind had a bit of commentary added to it by a set of academics. Um, neither of those things was true. It was really something that evolved through the conversations and um, in my view, and I hope you'll agree, uh, with real success. So it's, what, it's not just the, the exhibition but also the process that I hope we'll reflect on together today and what it means to um, to bring together two kinds of creativity, the creativity of academic scholarship and the creativity of the artist. Um, the book of Revelation, in a way, is ideal material 
for an exhibition that is so visual. And actually, of course, it's not only visual, it's sensory in a number of ways. But um, the Book of Revelation is remarkable for its visuality. And if Natasha were here, uh, she would have said, uh, as she does in her essay, that it's possibly the most visual, most sort of visually reproduced book in the Bible. It's one of the books to which artists have most often responded in, in very, very different and diverse ways. And it's partly because it's got extraordinarily vivid images in it. Some of them actually, I say vivid, some of them are almost impossible to conceptualize, to visualize, because they're, they're weird. Um, and, uh, and yet the challenge of, of the very weirdness of those images, I think, has often acted precisely as a stimulus to different artists who um, want to try their metal, as it were, to um, see whether drawing on their own artistic resources, they can rise to the challenge of making visual something that seems so odd and un, in some way unfamiliar. It's also a, a, a book of the Bible in which the word like is used a great deal, things being like other things or as, as other things, which um, can sound funny in a contemporary culture where idiomatically people throw the word like into sentences all the time. So there appeared a figure whose feet were like burnished brass or a sea that was like glass. But um, it's very interesting to think about the like word and the way in which it, it is, a, is again a stimulus to our imaginations to make connections which we might not naturally make. Our imaginations work constantly, analogically, with this concept of things being like but not identical to other things. Um, how do we explore both the continuities but also the discontinuities between one thing and another? How do we need there to be points of reference which, um, which can inform our imaginations while, um, when we conjure a world like the world conjured in the book of Revelation? but also at the same time need more than continuities, things that spring us from what we know towards what we don't know. And that, I think, is probably the last point I want to make before I hand over to Aaron. That sense of being sprung from what we know to what we don't know is another, it seems to me, a key purpose of the book of Revelation. It wants to make us see things we didn't see before, things we, as it were, don't yet know, to make us see perhaps more deeply um, into the reality which we inhabit, perhaps more far into a future we have yet to encounter, but in either case, to see more. And the figure of John, John of Patmos, who is the putative visionary narrator of the book, is described very properly as a seer. Again, the visuality of the book coming very much to the fore in this idea of John as a seer, somebody who sees beyond the surface of things who sees more or further, and then invites us to share that particular vision. And in that respect, I hope perhaps not too glibly, one might reflect on the way in which artists themselves function somewhat like, haha, somewhat like John the Seer, in that they too, as uh, visionaries, seek to, to offer the more that they see to make it shareable with uh, others, and in that sense, um, invite us all into a larger vision of things. So that's to put a few initial ideas out there, um, which we can discuss uh, together. But I'm now going to invite our first reader of the apocalypse to ride up to the podium, and that is, <laughs> who's wincing. Um, that's Erin Rosen, who is, um, both a lecturer in sacred traditions and the arts here in our department in theology and religious studies, but also uh, in the liberal arts program here at King's. And he's the uh, deputy director of our Center for Arts and the Sacred at King's. A wonderful colleague, always stimulating. And um, Aaron, live up to that. Thanks, Matt. I'm happy to introduce the next one. My microphone doesn't amplify, so you've got to speak. That's all right, I'm a bit squawky. No, I feel particularly well, so I'm not at my most sort of galloping speed, but maybe at a, a slow trot, I can offer some reflections. Um, and no further horse metaphors. Um, so I, one of the things that Ben um, asked if I would uh, speak on, and it's funny to be having um, handwritten notes in the midst of such a technological flurry of everything that Michael has produced, uh, Ben writing things on the train, and the most sort of pre-modern technology was that, so I was writing Britain's wonderfully 
I would still say 19th century trains uh, into work um, to be reflecting on what it means to have uh, to think about uh, the Book of Revelation in uh, in the 21st century. Um, uh, in terms of uh, my sort of inspiration for my reading, I mean, I think um, uh, a lot of that comes out of my teaching and uh, the teaching I did this term uh, with uh, Devin Apps, one of our uh, PhD students, uh, and also I've been happy to see some of my students who managed to struggle their way here. It's what, what my wife informally calls my Lady Gaga in the Bible class, um, where uh, we look at the Bible um, in relation to a lot of popular culture material, um, but hopefully sprinkle in a sufficient dosage of Kafka and Kierkegaard to make it seem academic. Um, but um, uh, one of the first things that um, Michael thought is because I have long hair that I might be interesting and be able to talk about um, things that were popular. And so we talked about video games. Of course, I know absolutely nothing about it because I can't play anything beyond Tetris. Um, so, um, so, but we, I, I thought it would be an interesting challenge for me to talk about um, video games, actually. And, uh, and, and also because to, it was an opportunity to overcome my personal prejudice, which is that I, you, know, you often see works of scholarship these days about the, um, about, there's a whole new discipline called video game studies or something like this, which of course I naturally abhor because again, despite having long hair, I'm actually quite sort of um, uh, an old fogey and quite traditionalist. Um, but then I thought to myself, if Republicans in America it really hate video games, there must be something of merit in them. Um, so then I, I challenged myself to think what, it, what that might be and how I could sort of take an antagonistic um, perspective given that we always um, hear that with no scientific evidence that it's video games that are responsible for all the problems in the youth. As we know in the States, and as I mentioned in my essay, guns don't kill people, video games kill people. Um, so, uh, so I started from that rather sort of facile point, um, but as I got to reading, um, I was, had that you know, typically unsettled experience of finding that one's prejudices perhaps were not exactly true, um, and that there were some interesting um, theoretical dimensions to gaming, and some of the things that I have just a very tiny throwaway in my, my little essay, and I, in fact, there, and uh, parenthetically, I mentioned two terms which naturally gripped me because they seemed impenetrable and incomprehensible. So um, one was ludonarrative dissonance, um, and that was um, when there's a tension between the narrative in a game and its, and its gameplay, what you're actually doing. And I thought that actually that, had, that was a very ripe way in the 21st century to begin to think about a lot of ethical dilemmas that, um, that we have at a macro level an understanding of where we, uh, what we're supposed to do, what, the art, what kind of situation we've been placed in, and yet the actual opportunities that avail us to the kind of gameplay that we experience. And I think this might be not even unfamiliar to those in an academic context or any institution would be how it is that you find ways of sort of um, resisting or adhering to priorities at the same time that you experience a kind of a gap there. So how it is we might compare video gaming to our, our, our sort of social and political lives. Um, the other was emergent gameplay. Um, and the more I thought about it, I thought that actually um, uh, there's, there's opportunities to apply some of this to how we might read the Bible itself, and that was one of the, the outcomes for me of thinking about this, was how some of these other technologies and, and these um, sort of uh, leisure activities that Michael's engaging with in a very serious way might sort of be um, brought back to bear on some very sort of primary, primal material. And I thought, why not consider um, the Garden of Eden as its own example of, uh, of sort of emergent gameplay, that we're given a, a scenario and we're not actually sure, God sort of places like a game of The Sims or something, God, and Michael's in fact dealt with this in a way in some of his earlier work, which I'm featuring in a new book, um, uh, where he, he engages with the, the Garden of Eden and, um, and uh, virtual reality, is what do you then do with all these different elements? Um, the tree of life and the tree of, of knowledge of, of good and evil, and is the outcome actually predetermined? Do we know what kind of game God wants us to play? 
um, or are we sort of contesting that? And how do you win the game? Do you win the game by failing what God wants you to do, uh, failing to adhere, which then propels you into the next level, even though it's, um, there's something quite burdensome about life, or not? So, um, the, you know, we could also think um, that, I, you know, we, we could extend this analogy, if, if you forgive, perhaps it's a little facile, but we might think that God is continually pressing the reset button, right? So God is, God's a little bit um, pestered by how we end up playing the game, which he thinks he's set up very sufficiently, and then realizes that actually we need to completely start over and reboot when we get to the time of the flood, and we do this successively at different biblical moments. Um, uh, just a couple other ideas. We might think whether God um, is the uh, God is a character in the game, or God is the designer of the video game, and God is, uh, and it might allow us some opportunity to think about what it means in um, our capacity, whether as artists or as uh, theologians, or or really just as as people, how it is that we uh, that that we create things, and how it is that we organize uh, scenarios, and how we might use that to understand the dilemmas of God in the book of. Uh, in the book of Genesis. Um, and maybe a last element of this emerging gameplay is that uh, in some cases, the, the new tendency as games is not to have the, um, the, the win, the, not to have everything completely realized, I think, and to have this very open universe. Um, and so the question is, um, do we live in a kind of a predetermined environment? Do we have everything that's coded in there? How far can you press to the sort of edges of the known universe? Um, and this kind of flat world which we've created in video game, does it really go on forever? And I think there is a common, there is a way then to bring that back even to, um, to, to Calvin and other uh, theologians. So, uh, so this just began, I began to have some of these sort of muddled thoughts as I was um, thinking about um, how I could be possibly a little bit useful to, uh, to Michael. Um, but when I saw his work, one of the things that struck me is that, um, is that some of the fun that we have as critics is from, uh, from thinking that we've discovered meaning in something. And so in, in a sense, the challenge was, I would, I'm always so delighted when I think I've thought of something very clever when I go to an art exhibition, but if I've been involved in both suggesting something and then listening to Michael respond to that and taking it, if that element of complete surprise is, is gone, um, have I, is, does one's experience as a, as a viewer change? Um, so, I, so I had to then sort of force myself to think of not sort of reconstructing some of the discussions that we had and the way you visualize that, but some of the other dimensions that came about through that particular pleasure of watching something get realized in an actual work of art, um, beyond the ideas which may have sort of generated it um, to begin with. Um, and, uh, and some of the things that I, that I saw, of course, were that we have um, in these, uh, uh, this triptych that, uh, that Michael's presented with us with, um, I began to think, you know, who is it that's in control of this? Is it we as the, as the viewer, or is it, does Michael sort of retain this control himself that we are watching things that he has already played out, these sort of scenarios? What would it mean if we were to insert controllers back into this? And I began to think of um, altar pieces that, um, that where you would have, uh, that would be more like Nintendos. Um, uh, if, did Nintendo still exist? Is that a thing? Absolutely. Yes, okay. Um, maybe the controllers are different. Now they sense my body and all these things. Um, but, um, and, and, and that sort of made me think of uh, Bill Viola's work and his, uh, his martyr's altarpiece in uh, St. Paul's. And I even think, which is sort of more, as it were, faithful to, uh, to contemporary experience? Um, and, uh, and is there a way in which uh, you're giving us perhaps more of an altar in some ways? Could we, could we, could we switch these positions? Could we switch these works around in location? What if we put Bill Viola back into a gallery context, even though he's attempting to do something which is very rooted in the space of St. Paul's and giving us something presented like an altar? And what if you take your triptych and put it in St. Paul's? Is there something, and I wondered if we were to relocate your work, whether we'd find that, and this is kind of an open question, that there is a, uh, a kind of cynical appreciation of, uh, 
or a skewering of the fact that um, video games are always presented in the general um, discourse as something that we, we idolize and we get sort of absorbed into. So are you presenting that for us or are you laying it out as some, and, um, and inviting us deeper into that experience of what it means to gape and be immersed in these, well, I think they even call them immersive uh, video games. Um, or are you telling us that we, that, that we in a, with a sense of admonition, that we need to step back and we need not to get completely sucked into this um, environment? Um, uh, just a couple last um, thoughts. The other thing I, I thought was that, um, you know, you really, and it's a very basic thought, but you, you show us what goes in by simply framing these, by framing, reframing them, but by giving them these gilded frames. I mean, it brings us back to a lot of our historical examples that I talk about um, in my essay, but I think it also gives us something of the, uh, what some people have called the technological sublime. And I think it's very easy, you know, the kind of people who play video games, especially, it's not all teenage um, kids, but I, I, I saw my, I happened to catch my brother in a naughty moment not reading the other day and playing video games with something incredibly complex in some dystopian universe that it was, that, um, that the amount of work that goes into these things, I mean, it is absolutely staggering. And I actually, I, I find um, that, you know, our opportunities to encounter the sublime, are, and maybe you agree or disagree, but have sort of withered in some respects. And yet, when by placing this on the gallery wall, I, it made me realize that, um, that this would be completely stupefying beyond me to see the connection between these ones and zeros. And now I have this light mist that sort of, um, that passes through one panel to the next. That how is it that these things are even created? And is it possible to make a jump from this technological sublime to a religious sublime, or are those different experiences? Um, so those are just some of the initial thoughts that I had in, um, in looking at Michael's work. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to move straight on, and there's lots there, and I'm sure that you that stimulated thoughts in you, but I'm going to move straight on and ask Michelle Fletcher to come up as our second reader. And, um, Michelle uh, is um, coming near the end of uh, PhD work in archaeology and religious studies, and unfortunately one of her two supervisors is interdisciplinary in the sense that I come from a background in uh, systematic theology, and her other supervisor is Eddie Adams, one of our other readers, who we'll hear from later on. Um, who's a New Testament scholar. So, um, Michelle knows how to speak more than one language in disciplinary terms as well as uh, in strictly you know, linguistic terms. Um, and in this case, she's also um, uh, adopted the language of contemporary culture, or explored the language of contemporary culture, and we're very happy Michelle, over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you to everybody who um, allowed me to be involved in this. It's been amazing, and I hope through my brief summary now as I talk about my own ideas and uh, some of the things that have come back to me about how we can read Revelation that you can see just how rich an experience this has been for all of us. Um, first of all, the inspiration for my reading. I specialize in looking at how Revelation uses the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And the tension between past and present really came to the fore in our initial um, discussions. Michael, obviously, those of you who've seen it, um, I'll just show the first slide of my exhibition. It's quite cutting edge what he's using. And Michael is certainly sat on the edge of where technology can take us at the moment. And then he's coming into dialogue with me and saying, oh, but this happens in Revelation. And I'm saying, oh, yes, but actually, that's a bit more like Daniel than, uh, than Revelation. And you've forgotten it's first in Isaiah, putting on my very geeky scholarly voice. And there was this real tension between Michael pushing the boundaries um, with the future, with the edge of the present, and me going, well, hang on, we need to remember the past. We need to bear in mind what the text is doing. At the same time as I found this own tension with myself and Michael, well, there was also a comment early on made in the discussions by someone else um, with what's being done here that's really new. Haven't we seen this before? We've seen Revelation read as Apache helicopters. We've seen bombs. What is new? And I thought that's very true. Revelation has a strong history of everybody interpreting it and thinking, yeah, I've got the answer. So why is this anything new? 
But then at the same time, that person to me represented a completely different temporal location to myself. I did not grow up doing duck and cover waiting for the nuclear holocaust to come. My position was different. And so this took me into looking at um, reconsidering my experience with film. I also work with film as well as with uh, the biblical manuscripts. And I realized when I approach film, some of my favorite films, Terminator, Wings of Desire, Blade Runner, that they're situated in a very different temporal location with the Cold War. You know, I went to East Berlin on my honeymoon. <laughs> That's very different from when Wings of Desire uh, was first filmed, looking at the division with the wall there. And I realized that I, too, was a product of my own location, feeling this tension. And so at the beginning of my, um, my essay, you'll see that I've used a quote from Wings of Desire, where Damiel says, I don't want to be stuck in forever. I want to cry now, now, not forever. And so the inspiration for my piece was this tension between what happens where we have this continued inheritance, where, yeah, people have been there before us, revelation, it's using what's been seen before. Of all the books of the New Testament, it uses the Hebrew Bible more than any other. It is awash with it. People try and count it, but it's up to 600, 800 allusions to the Hebrew Bible. Revelation is looking back all the time and looking at its inheritance, but at the same time, it's in a different temporal location. It is written to the Roman Empire whereas the texts it's dealing with are talking to Babylon, to Assyria, to different empires. And so for me, I wanted to combine that feeling of continuity of interpretation with the tension of subjectivity and different positions of reading. And I feel that Michael in the room has just done that so much. Two responses of people that came to see the exhibition on the opening night I was with. One said, I won't say of either who these people were. One said, it's very strange what he's done here. In trying to decode it, it seems like he's recoded it, and it's even more complicated. And the other one said, um, wow, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Every single person in this room, based on the cookies on their phone, when these QR codes are generating their different readings on the wall here, every single person would get a different reading because of their browsing history. We'd all see this differently. And I felt that this really showed the tension within this. We've got the idea that you walk into the room and you think, um, where's the text of Revelation gone? <laughs> I certainly can't read it on the wall. But at the same time, it's decoding it into our here and now through its continual projection onto the wall. And also, it's holding the tension between past and present with elevating these wonderful gold engravings, which are used uh, using the laser etching in this glass cabinet, giving a sense of continuity and of sacredness, like a stone tablet, but in this QR code, which is so, so different. And so it's holding that tension of this past inheritance, but cutting edge technology. And so for me, what this really shows us, and what I really hope this can help us with the book of Revelation, is this realization that Revelation is actually we often think, oh, Revelation, the future, the yet to come, what's coming? And I think what Michael's exhibition really gives for us is actually the sense of the fact that the present, we can only ever sit as far forward on the present as in cutting edge. That's as far into the future as we can look. The guide that we actually have for the future is our inherited past, people's past interpretations of Revelation, the Hebrew Bible that turns up in Revelation, and so the idea that we're teetering on the edge of an unknown future, and it's the past which is informing us, and that we have this inherited interpretation of Revelation, I feel for me that's been an overwhelming experience uh, from my room and also from all of the other rooms. Um, looking at the New Jerusalem, I'll never look at the New Jerusalem again in the same way from that room. That's really, really blown my little mind. Um, but at the same time, he's taking me as far as I can go. I can't actually see the New Jerusalem in the text. It hasn't arrived, right? Revelation hasn't come true. But at the same time, I'm getting a new experience of it, and I'm getting a way of seeing it with all of my historical knowledge being fed into that. So I think I'll wrap it up there. But uh, that's my take. Thank you, sir. In a minute, I'm going to invite some of your questions and, and comments, but just let me say a couple of brief things about the, 
the horse room, the horses technology room, and how that came about. The, I think it was the first um, gathering that we had of academics from the department with Michael um, was one where I, I can't remember quite where the horse entered the discussion, but I know the horse entered the discussion very early. And then we spent a huge amount of time talking about horses. And suddenly everybody had stories about their, um, the particular way they felt about horses. And in some cases, in a number of cases actually, uh, scared, scared was one of the things they felt about horses, or at least remembered feeling scared as children um, encountering these very large creatures, um, beautiful but, but big. And um, so, and, and there were a lot of uh, allusions made to films and uh, in particular, but also um, uh, other artistic uh, depictions of the horse, where again the scariness of the horse um, was brought out. So, but also the power, which is obviously connected with that. So we talked a bit about Equus, and we, we recalled films like The Fisher King, where these terrifying visions of, um, of um, warrior-type figures on horseback featured. Uh, and that was, that was the beginning of this, I think, then more articulated set of reflections on the way in which horses function to enhance the power of human beings, and in many cases, the power of some human beings over against others. In other words, their role in conflict and their role as extensions of, of the human body. Um, and as one great 20th century theologian who's written a great deal on the book of Revelation, Hans Urs von Balthasar, says, when we meet what he calls the battle of the logos in the book of Revelation, it's precisely the logos being the word of God. Uh, it's fascinating that this most powerful figure appears on horseback. It's not only the four horsemen who we see on horseback, it's also the logos. In other words, God, Christ, the Christ, a Christ figure, one of the Christ figures in the book. Um, and this is disturbing, it seems to me, and it's something that I wanted to touch on in, in my essay, because it seems as if um, God appears in the form of the logos, at any rate, uh, simply as another horseman of the apocalypse, almost. Um, and in that sense, using the same kind of techniques of um, military might in order to achieve particular ends that um, we might associate with our more disturbing visions of the human being on horseback. Um, and it was at that point, uh, and also partly because I had been having conversations with another artist who works a great deal with, with animals, uh, with animal bodies and body parts, uh, that I remembered and perhaps should have thought of it before, that, that Christ appears also in the form of the lamb, um, and perhaps more centrally in the end, because it's in the form of the lamb that, again, in one of those odd and peculiarly difficult to visualize images, uh, that Christ is said to be on the throne of heaven, along with God the Father. There's this odd, sort of odd image where you're meant to try and imagine both God and the lamb, God, God the Father and the lamb on the throne, and um, painters have sometimes had difficulty with this without it looking too silly um, and have sort of got around it by having the lamb kind of half on the throne or with its front hooves on the throne but it, it is a difficult sort of image um, anyway Michael didn't try and visualize the lamb but it, it does um, but his reflections on the horse do I think pose a question to us and to the way that we use the book um, because the lamb is there as a wounded figure, not as a symbol of power, or at least if it's a symbol of power, the lamb is a symbol of power, one through weakness, through sacrifice or woundedness. And it's also very interesting that these wounds abide even in heaven. It's one of the images we have of, of, of uh, if you like, the fact that the history of Christ in the redemption of the world is a history that is in some ways um, not wiped out in heaven, but in some ways transfigured and preserved. Um, and in that, in that sense, if we ask how is it that that woundedness has a place in heaven, we need to see it as in some way part of the perfection of the heavenly condition, the perfection of, of heaven because it is a woundedness in the service of love. So the lamb stood suddenly as a sort of curious counterpoint 
to the, to the Logos on horseback fight, waging war. And, um, and highlighted in a very powerful way for me the fact that this book does not, as it were, decide certain things. That the, the, the imagery, which is so profuse in the book of Revelation, is in some sense generated in its profusion in order not to kind of con necessarily to conclude certain things, but to leave us with ambiguities. And in some ways, perhaps, to suggest that we, we are not um, to rest with certain kinds of established binaries, the logos against evil, um, good and bad, light and dark, separating out, and one ultimately defeated by the other. But perhaps in some other way, alongside that image, there's an incorporative, incorporating, um, inclusive dynamic, um, which in some way is related to this idea of, uh, of the lamb. And that's to, just to conclude why I find um, Michael's use of the, the, the black and white coding, which recurs in various rooms throughout the exhibition, so fascinating. Because what part of what he's reflecting on is the way that, that binaries help us to think and help us to do things. They're very effective tools, binaries, in order to assist various kinds of um, human enterprise. But at the same time, what he's done is make these binary codes into forms of artistic expression that resist any straightforward binary. I mean, just as Aaron said that the ones and zeros can end up looking like mist, in the computer, fine mist, delicate mist in the computer games. There's a sense, too, in which the codes, as Michael puts them to work in this artistic creation, um, become more than themselves and more than simply black and white. They become communicative at another level and in some ways also integrative of the various meanings uh, in the exhibition. So those are a few thoughts from uh, my point of view. And I do actually think my room as I like to think of it, the horse room is the most beautiful in the exhibition. I love, I love the room, I love the sound and the lighting. Um, and that does remind me, by the way, that uh, I didn't mention this, that today's event finishes at five with wine reception, um, and it's going to be over in the exhibition. So uh, if you haven't seen it already, you'll have a chance to. And if you have, you'll have another chance uh, to see it. And you can go and drink your wine in the horse room. That's what I will be doing. <laughs> um, so at this point, having heard from... Uh, from three of our readers, um, I'm going to ask you if you'd like to make comments or, or ask questions, uh, particularly in relation to those who've spoken already. Um, and then I'm going to ask Simon Woodman to respond more, slightly more formally. Can I just ask uh, you to raise your hands if you've, if you've been to see the exhibition, just to get an idea? Who's, who's seen it? OK, so we've about half. Good, the rest of you have a treat in store then. Um, uh, how many of you, this is another, just, just get a sense of, of the perspectives in the room, how many of you um, have read the book of Revelation in the New Testament? Okay, slightly more. Um, I suppose one of the questions to those who, of you who have seen the exhibition is whether it's something that make, has made a difference to the way you think about the book or the way you might read the book. We might ask uh, another question. Is um, what your what your first memory of the Book of Revelation is? It, is it that you remember hearing it in um, in a liturgical context? Maybe you heard it in church. Do you remember reading it? Um, do you remember watching the Terminator um, or listening to Sister Gertrude or Jesus Sister Mo Wendy? Sinnerman? What's your what's your you know what is your what's a, a primary sort of early memory of the Book of Revelation? That's a gentle question. Thank you, Aaron. Gentle, yeah. yeah well, I think uh, Jude's four horsemen is very sort of guiding uh, image anyway of Revelation. And um, no, I'm interested to see how um, I've seen the exhibition, so I'm um, interested to see how that um, works on that. But I, I think. Um, Yeah, I think that image where it, it, it's one of the earliest images of, of, of God, which sums, sums Revelation up. I think me too. I think I saw that before I read it at all. For those of you who might not have heard the back, that's the Jura um, images of the, of the four horsemen. Um, any other? Yes? I was just thinking, my main, uh, my main 
been approached always through art, through Dura or John Martin. And it just occurred to me that, um, in fact, they were using cutting edge technology to find their way through in exactly the same way. I mean, Dura and his print making, and uh, John Martin took his pictures all around the country. It was a you know, big kind of um, a picture show that people who couldn't get to London. So I hadn't thought of that until now, actually. Mm. <laughs> And it's interesting that you say that because those were two of my big inspirations. Um, those, both those artists I've known about since I was very young. If you look at Durer, um, the fact that he was actually producing that set of works, it's at the rise of the printing press. So of course that's sort of a major technological shift <coughs> for us in terms of communication. Um, a lot of scholars would say, we have not seen a revolution um, since then, you know, until now, with the advent of sort of computer technology and networks. And sort of, again, the exponential leap in terms of our ability to communicate in different ways. For Martin, I love his works in the play of the Apocalypse piece. He's very much done in his office. So if you actually think about how he was so popular for the time, and derided as being pop. Um, paint is a technology, the process of painting is a technological process that changes <coughs> over ages. Um, and if you look at sort of video games as a system, as a technology, um, people ask me sort of when I create my virtual environments, like the other works that Aaron was referring to, I, I paint the environment, I just do it with XML, for example, instead of code just defining things as, just as a painter would sort of pick their brushes, pick their paints, mix their paints. I do the same process, but I just do it in code. So it's really sort of, I think of a piece like the Play the Apocalypse, but very much as a painting. Is this, um, could I just ask, is this something totally new for you? Or do you feel you be exploring your way into this sort of thing before, I mean, uh, or was this a revelation for you in the work you were doing? Um, the combination of new and old, no, certainly not. That's probably been on my mind as an artist for my whole career, for the last 20 years. And so far as if you look at sort of certain, I mean, here's a good sort of analogy, which um, the story I tell students when I lecture on, um, if you think about a technology like virtual reality, a lot of people will think of that as a very sort of modern invention. They'll think of computer systems, immersive caves, headsets, things like that. They'll say 20th century, like 20th, 21st century technology. But then I'll bring up the fact it's like, okay, but if we look at sort of concepts that these are based on illusion immersion, that dates back well into antiquity. If you think about Reddit wallpaper, which is a scenic, blended architectural, in a sense, metal projection space using the technology of their time. Um, those principles have been with us forever. And then some people in sort of the VR community, um, like one of the fathers of VR, Howard Reinhold, will argue, and I, I agree, that you look back even to prehistory, say the cave paintings in Lasso, where using the technology of the time, it's, it's a communal space, it's a scenographic space, it's a pagan space. I mean, all these things. So again, I, I, I see the lineage there. Um, so certainly, sort of that combination of the old is something that's been with me in my, my whole career, and I've been interested in. But in terms of the particular theological bed that I've done with this exhibition in collaboration with, with Ben, Natasha, who can't be here and here, and Michelle, and, and Eddie, know that that's certainly Three other people I have, so, and I think Patricia, were you, you were the first, and then Wei Xiang, and then John. Well, actually, I was only just going to. All right, anyways, and with Aaron's question. Please do. And thinking about the sort of the the technology that we're talking about, 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 and in the 60s, it was such a prevalent image. So that everything else that I ever remember, it sort of went out of the 
window because, again, using what you're saying about um, using equipment or whatever methods were being used, we were being manipulated and having a sense of fear imposed. And the fear was a visual image of these uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse galloping towards us in the form of the nuclear explosion. So the bringing it all together as I was listening to actually, again, in terms of revelation and memories and prompting what we know that we bring to the present, it, it all somehow seemed to come together. So thank you. And also, um, just to say, revelation has been said, it is so visual and it is there to terrify and because they're living in a visual culture that most people won't live through. There's the statues of the Roman Empire everywhere of the <coughs> emperor. Know, um, ben and I have discussed this idea of the people who kind of were with you all the time, who were the statues. Statutory, visual imagery, bearing down on you, that sense of something being there, bigger than you, and in control of you. The Greco Roman world was alive with it. And so actually the fact that Revelation continues to have that impact, even now when we might not have the statues. I think that speaks of something of the inheritance of the people at the time. Yes, absolutely And also, I just want to tell the subjectivity of picking up on the transportation of John Martin and the painting of where he was going around the country. That's also fascinating. I think Revelation was a circular letter. It's written to seven different congregations in seven different churches. So even the one historical document when we look back at it, we don't have a unified viewpoint of this one congregation sat in one place hearing one message. Some of the cities were Greek, some of the cities were classed as Roman cities. They won their status in the diaspora as Roman cities. So they're hearing very different things in very different places all at the same time. And so I think that plays out well in the text. Wait. Um, I think my first impression about revolution was when I was a kid, there was so much who are about number 666 and how it coded into barcodes. So it was quite funny to step into a room with your barcodes. <laughs> and, and how it kind of had a sense of a redeeming factor as well as a, a subtle challenge to very often familiar notions of how we read revelation. It is often in the field of technology and chips that will be embedded in us in the day of the devil. And yet, seeing how technology meets uh, theology and the sacred text and how it becomes so generative and how we are a lot more in technology than we think we are. Um, I think it was quite a pleasant surprise and how Revelations, how I read it was, it was often linear as if we're moving from the past and we're finding where the future is. But I think the various exhibits have placed past, present, and future together, that there's a synergistic space. And I think that would be how I would try to reapproach revelation, that it is a meeting of the three time spaces of this, rather than the new John. I was struck by the scariness in the horse room. Do you speak up so that the people at the back? I was struck by the, the, the scariness in the horse room. As a doctor, I was concerned that children are very scared of going to x-ray, and it is quite frightening with modern technology. And the way you've got this remarkable 3D printing there, and the way it's lit, it really does look quite scary. And we've talked about the scariness of horses, and I think of the equus particularly, of horses being scary, and children, if you take children down to uh, Horse Guard Parade, and the horses there, they're very lit, very big. And I wonder whether that there is in the book of Revelation is scary in many ways, and so is modern technology, and they both have that end, the end of things. Or is that a conscious thing that you had in that particular room? Well, I, I certainly wanted to give it an atmosphere that could be seen to be fearful, so far as that, that is much of what the book is, mm -hmm. the imagery of it. Brings forth, at least to me, I don't think that holds true for a lot of people. Um, not that I believe that technology is evil. Technology has no agency. Um, it is humanity that controls technology. And we do with it what we will, for good or for bad. 
But this idea of the, the horse and technology for me was trying to put forward this idea of technology as just being potential. Potential we can use for different things. And of course, we often, with technology, we, we don't have the right conversations about things. We, um, I think, have a tendency to perhaps not have the right checks and balances. And so if people walk into that room and they are afraid, then I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing insofar as that the technology is in there. Um, and this came up in one of our, our sort of readers' meetings where if you look back at a few generations, well, we've already talked about sort of the, uh, the nuclear war generation, the Cold War generation, where it was nation states, really, that would bring the end of us, again, through technology. But now we live in a day and age, I mean, my daughter growing up, it's not a nation state. You can basically have someone that writes a brilliant computer virus that takes down so much infrastructure. Um, you could actually have a bioengineer that develops a new virus. The things with, um, we talk about gun control, but we live in a day and age where you can actually know what you're doing. And I would be classified as one of those. You, you can actually print a gun in your own house using prosumer equipment, which is going to be, in the next decade, potentially in everyone's home. So I think we've shifted from this, this point of sort of where as individuals, we have had very little power with technology to a time now when we're actually very empowered with technology. And if we choose to use that for the wrong ends, then that is going to be a problem. So, and that is something we should talk about. That is something that should be here. Um, so if people actually get that from that room, then I'm not disappointed with that. Do you think we would be more empowered on technology? Absolutely. Look at all the different things that are going on today. You think about some of the things like the Arab Spring, social media, the empowerment, um, the ability, and again, in many ways, it comes down, I think, to the ability to communicate, to transfer information. Um, certainly, the printed press revolutionized things in terms of putting information in the hands of, the, let's say, the average person. Or the more, you know, it, it was not information sort of kind of coming down from, from people in power. Um, same thing you have today. Where with the technology, the, the technological infrastructure we have available, um, the average citizen can do so much with that. Yes, I'd like to be well, I think you're right, we are, but um, it also brings with it um, certain dangers, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. On the ability to communicate, my, the, the day my eldest son got his first smartphone was the day he stopped talking to me when I picked him up from school. It was just literally an overnight change. He got into the car and he was, of course he was communicating but not to me, and not through the use of his voice. And one might argue that the, the quality of the communication might have been somewhat different, yes. possibly. But, so the, the, but he, he came to the exhibition and loved it. So it's interesting, the scariness is, is there. But I think probably, for me, one of the interesting things about it was also how much fun it is. And in a way, this is a question to Michael, as, uh, as well as to a, any of us involved in it, um, it, how, how, should we, how should we interpret the fact that so much fun is to be had with the Book of Revelation, as well as the other serious matters that are raised by this? Is this something that's in some way in continuity with the book as well? Um, or are we playing with it in a way that perhaps is less than, less than serious? I don't know. Um, does anybody have a thought? Well, I, I wonder whether both... We also we play with things in order to neutralize our, our fear of them as well. We sort of inoculate ourselves with a certain amount of, of, of a, a certain type of a game or, or sort of putting our toes in the water. We continually do these kind of things. So it's very natural in a way that we, 
that we use the book of Revelation as, as something that we dip into and we pull back from, and, and there's different ways. You know, I, I think it's, it reminds me of sort of Franz Rosenzweig's description of, of the sort of Jewish ritual calendar, that you, you approach this kind of sublimity and the terror of judgment at Yom Kippur, but then you go back into harvest festivals. You come, you can, that really, that this inbuilt sort of religious sensibility, you go this far, but then you retreat because you realize you can't always dwell in that. Um, that moment of existential anguish. I think the um, uh, I think the other thing that I noticed was that first of all, there um, you know I, I remember as a kid discovering uh, horse bones in the in the in the forest and thinking that there were dinosaurs and things. There's something very sort of estranging about seeing a horse like that. It shows how little we how little a part of our reality dead things are, um, and also just animals, things that would have been rec easily recognizable to people for centuries. But to us, I mean, you could show this to numerous school kids, and they would, I'm sure, be convinced it was a dinosaur. Um, no, seriously, I'm sure everyone would think it was a raptor, because their first, men their first thought would be Jurassic Park. Sure, of course. Um, but um, that, but it, it looks like it's sort of this mama uh, skull, you know, surrounded by its progeny, and which is interesting. And it has, it looks like it's a scene of some sort of um, ritual that's about to happen that you're sort of recreating. But the other thing I noticed is maybe that there, that there's, it's also hints to the limitations of technology, right? Because we're supposed to be sort of incredibly impressed with the power of three D printing, but it's, it looks to me like you could only print around here, but it couldn't go in. So it had to, so all the of them are sort of proofs. Yeah. Yeah, the, the way I designed it, well, I mean, there was some technical things with that, but, but certainly um, when you say the progeny, that is how um, I thought about it. Because it's just, for me, it was to show this idea of amplification, of transformation, that you take the singular, the original, the organic, but then now, with what we have available to us, you can just, you can get the endlessness of it. So with this, it's, I designed the, the prints to be made, one for Dells, literally. Um, the exhibition, sort of the, the person who's looking over the exhibition, she starts it off in the morning, and then it prints through the day for 12 hours, and then gets added to the print at the end. Well, well it, it, have you designed a pattern out of the other? No, no, no. I, I leave that to, to them. Oh, OK. So it is a bit like the casting of Norman yes. Doomy or something. Or it's, it's mm -hmm. pretty Yes, in fact. Um, what about the idea that you almost play a lot when you enter a video game as sort of comparison to the idea is this constant revelation? So in a video game where you can create the environment and then interact with it, it's almost comparison to the world based the environment here and then interact with it. Or, for example, you choose when to end the game, it's so almost comparison to the idea that the relation is coming and it's going to be then. Is that considered almost as a business experience? And so, and so, that's certainly something that I've thought about in my conversations with, with Aaron um, with regards to his, his book and um, um, artwork that he chose to put in that book. I would say in terms of certain uh, video games where you're playing a character, no, that's actually like being a person. If you're not God, I would say that the game is on this in that situation of God because the narrative, the, the sort of the macro narrative, if you will, is set, that's defined. Uh, as the player, like the individual, the micro narrative, the sort of five moment narrative that you're playing through, that's your decision. Um, but you were adopting this persona, you were becoming an individual in that kind of reality. For the kind of work that is in shared virtual environments, so that where basically there is no head designer, you are both the player and the creator then that's where things start to get a bit blurred and quite interesting in terms of thinking about that in a theological context, which is why I think, Aaron, you, you selected the visions of our communal dreams on work that I read, because literally that's, that's an artwork that is, in many ways, you could say, uses the, the story of the Garden of Eden as a source of inspiration so far as if you imagine a virtual world that starts with literally nothing, I, as sort of the designer of this world, put down the initial landscape in the first tree, and then everything else in that world is created in collaboration with hundreds of different individuals, making decisions and building up this world to be something else. 
Um, that's what we put on the idea of God. Thank you for the question. I'm going to just pause at this moment. Uh, uh, those of you who've got questions and comments, please hold them, because we're going to have more time for audience discussion later. But at, at this point, I want to um, invite Simon Woodman to come and give his response to the exhibition. And I'm very grateful to Simon for agreeing to do this. Um, uh, Simon did his own PhD on, on the book um, and um, went on to lecture in biblical studies at the University of Cardiff. And he's now minister of Bloomsbury Central Baptist Church here in London. So he has a great deal of knowledge of the book and also some of the ways in which it's read in the context of church life. Um, and so Simon, we're very much looking forward to hearing what, what you have to say in response to our exhibition. Thank you. Yeah, it's really good to be here. Uh, ben did say I, I could add to uh, the introduction if I needed to. I think I probably ought to say I'm also uh, part of the chaplaincy team here at King's. Um, I'm, the, uh, I'm a volunteer. Uh, I give my time. They give me a library card, so I consider this to be a fair exchange. Uh, so sometimes you will see me hanging around uh, looking chaplainy as well. Um, I was interested uh, in the... Uh, uh, the, the exhibition. Liz and I, my wife and I, were invited to the opening night and uh, we were able to wander around with a glass or two of wine and uh, if you haven't seen it yet and you're able to go over later and experience it with a glass of wine, it is the way to see it. So uh, that's, that's going to be something I'm looking forward to repeating. Um, Aaron asked what, what our first experiences of the book of Revelation were. Uh, mine was of um, terror followed by frustration. Uh, I, I grew up in, in, around, in and around a church, and the youth leader in my teens told me that uh, the world was going to end within five years um, because he'd been reading the book of Revelation. And I, I kind of believed him for all of about 24 hours until I decided to go away and read it for myself. And that began a journey which brings me to be here. So it's been wonderful to experience this exhibition and, and to move amongst the images uh, brought to life in the way that we have found here. Uh, there's been quite a lot of talk about horses, and uh, I will come back onto horses a little bit later, but Ben, I just wanted to pick up, you said about the idea of maybe seeing a, a Christ figure as one of the horses of the apocalypse. Of course, Irenaeus and Victorinus both make that identification that the first of the four horsemen should be understood Christologically as the same character as the rider on the white horse at the end. So it's a reading that, that I think I favor. So I think, I think we do have uh, a, a Jesus figure in there on one of the four horses in the text. But anyway, it seems to me that an artistic installation which combines the worlds of biblical hermeneutics and the book of Revelation and technology leads us into the thought world of Martin Heidegger. Uh, for those of you for whom your knowledge of Heidegger may be slightly rusty, um, his ideas took shape and form between the 1920s and the 1950s, a period of history, of course, that began in the aftermath of the great apocalyptic war to end all wars, whose centenary this year has triggered London's other great artistic showpiece of the autumn, the Blood Swept Lands installation, more commonly known as the Poppies at the Tower. Well, moving on through the 20th century, uh, Heidegger experienced some of the awesome technological feats of the American and Soviet military machines as they overpowered his native Germany and its national socialist dream to which he had in a, a, an earlier period found himself quite captivated. Uh, Heidegger was um, not favorably disposed to the advent of the so-called technological age he attempted rather to deconstruct the dominance of technology with an emphasis on art and poetry. So for Heidegger, technology was a danger that threatened humanity in its very being. He saw it as offering not objects to be mastered and used, but rather as a means of interpreting the world. Technology for Heidegger was not scientific progress, rather it was a mode of knowledge. It was a way of encountering truth. So Heidegger envisaged technology as unveiling, as a revelation, as a disclosing of that which had previously been concealed. To this end, he points to the Greek root word techne, and he highlights two principal features of this. Firstly, he says, techne is the name not only for the activities and skills of the craftsman, but also for the arts of the mind and the fine arts. 
He says, techne belongs to bringing forth, to poesis. It is something poetic. Secondly, he notes that techne is a mode of truth-telling. It is as revealing and not as manufacturing that techne and technology is a bringing forth, is a poetic act. So for Heidegger, the revelation of truth through technology is about simultaneously bringing some things out of concealment whilst concurrently concealing others. So an analogy would be uh, if you're uh, flicking through a radio dial, you tune into one radio frequency and that automatically silences all the others. However, it is the awareness of our attunement to one frequency that alerts us to the existence of others. It's very hard to tune into BBC Two or Radio Two without there being an implied BBC or Radio One alongside it. One can cannot focus exclusively upon that which is unconcealed without also being aware of that which yet remains muted and veiled. And the same is true, of course, as we walk around an object of artistic technology, as some of us already have and some of us will be later, glass of wine in hand. We see it from different perspectives as we move in and amongst its component parts and its different rooms. In order to see it all, we must see it just one aspect at a time. And the truth of the whole is brought forth as we encounter the partial. And it is this, this bringing forth of truth that takes us into the world of technology and art. Heidegger sees the technology of art as poetically revealing truth in such a way as to disrupt and create history in the world. He says that technology devoid of poiesis reduces humanity to numbers, to resources, it makes machines of us. However, technology as poiesis, as poetry, as art, brings forth the possibility for ever new interpretations that reconfigure and even recreate the world. So Heidegger describes technology as a mode of revealing. He says that it comes to presence in the realm where revealing and unconcealment take place, the place where truth happens. And at a base level, of course, the text of the Bible is itself an expression of technology. Reading and writing, as we have already heard, are human inventions. And the process of reading has seen technological developments down the centuries as the reading task has migrated from scroll to codex and now back to scrolling again. In this way, the technology of the text is encountered in the world as a resource to be mined for meaning. Interpretive models and programs are developed to unlock the text. However, the technology of letters on a page brings forth more than mere meaning. The poiesis of metaphor, the poetry of words, points to something that is greater than the sum of its parts. Technology becomes art and truth is revealed as the world is unveiled. And so the subject of our symposium today, this wonderful exhibition, takes us into a world unveiled through artistic technology. I'm going to just go briefly through the, to the different rooms. The horse as technology offers a revelation of our contemporary context as one which continues to be dominated by war and violence. We live in a world where the machinery of war reduces individual soldiers to tactical numbers and innocent casualties to collateral damage. And in this context, there is great significance to be found in unmasking the utilitarianism of treating a living creature as a tool of war. And the reduction of the horse to its bleached skull and then the mechanical reproduction of this image invites us to reflect on the relationship between the depersonalization of the other and the human capacity for violence. I'm just going to play with the word rendering for a moment. The horse skull is rendered in plastic by a machine and continually re-rendered. But the reduction of the other to bestial level allows the possibility for a mechanistic rendering of the meat of life as living flesh becomes bone in the theater of war. 
Then we come to playing the apocalypse and a new Jerusalem. I'll deal with those two rooms together. They invite us to sweep aside the boundary between reality and non-reality and to join with John of Patmos in stepping through the open door into another realm. The immersive technology of the video game industry allows us to inhabit his vision in ways otherwise impossible. So we journey through the city and encounter shifting perspectives and divergent attenuations. The question we're left with, however, as we leave the world of the video game, as we remove the virtual reality headset, is whether the world we are returning to is the same as the world that we left. Or do we, like John, return to a new world because the old world has now gone through our encounter with the vision? Technology has the capacity to shape the world, and as the virtual becomes the real, truth is both revealed and concealed, to take us back to Heidegger. Revelation as mirror offers us a variety of readings of the imagery of Revelation in ways that reveal the concerns and prejudices of the contexts which gave them birth. The presentation of these images from different periods of human history as stained glass windows with the leading comprising the text of Revelation itself takes us to the heart of Heidegger's exploration of the relationship between the technology of a text and the truth that the text evokes. The images may be transient, but the text through which they are brought into view continues to offer ever fresh insights into the world that it unmasks. And finally, Apocalypse Forever takes the text of Revelation into a new technological representation. From ancient Greek to machine code, the technology of meaning is subverted as the text becomes a series of signifiers that only a machine can read. From a technology designed to preserve and propagate human thought, the text becomes pure technology, as unreadable to us as a lost language inscribed on stone tablets displayed on the wall. And yet, with a Wi-Fi signal and a QR scanner on a mobile phone, the text comes to life once again, as it is decoded for a new world through the artistic technology of visionary truth. I think Heidegger would be both gratified and horrified as technology continues to unmask the world, revealing the truth that would otherwise remain hidden from view. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon, for um, such a thoughtful and, and helpful um, set of reflections on the exhibition. And um, it does prompt me to go back to a sentence, Michael, you said earlier about the technology being neutral and, you know, that it all depends what we, we do with it and wondering how, how often we could substitute the words art and technology in sentences like that and, and actually make an equally valid point. I wonder if that, I mean, is that something you would like to reflect on whether art similarly is neutral or whether what you've done as an artist in this exhibition is more intentionally unneutral, more concerned to change things or change people. Sorry, I didn't warn you about that question. Yes, so it just yeah. but it's, it's a fair question and a good one. And as a person, of course, I've had my opinions about things. As an artist, I try often to set those aside. I certainly, this show, like most of all my, my work and exhibitions, I'm not trying to tell people what to think. And in that, I think this was a very appropriate sort of um, reading that Simon has given. In terms of this idea, for me, it's unveiling that the first thing I've written on my notes is just seeking different than what you were talking about sort of seeing and seeing the book differently. Certainly that's all I really wanted to try to achieve with this, to allow people to come to the exhibition. Of course, it's based on me and my experiences that uh, date back from my early childhood to sort of growing up, my professional life, the wonderful collaboration that I've had with people in the theology department here at Kings and then make the show. But sort of taking that whole sort of journey of mind, creating these works which I wanted to add 
really as provocation to the starting point for people to have their own conversations and their own thoughts on this. It's not for me to actually say what one should think, what one should pull out in a particular work. It's more just to you know, give that sort of a bit of a provocation to say, what is, what is this making you think about? And it's sort of like people think their very personal way, which in my mind is very much in the spirit of the book itself. And I was asked in an interview about the show why I thought people um, were continuously fascinated with Revelation. I said, well, from my perspective, I think it's because as humans, we like to think of ourselves as being in a time period which is significant. So of course, if you look at humanity in significant sort of points, they're really, of course, too, the beginning and the end. In the beginning, none of us have ever seen. Um, but the end, that's something we, we might be a part of. So maybe that there's some kind of fascination we have for that. And in that, I think the, the, the text of Revelation, it, it talks about the end of times, but does it in a way that is so visceral that you can actually, where at least I, as, as a kid, I was reading it for the first time when I was like eight years old, around that age. You can, I, I could put myself into that text. I could, the, the images that it comes from, conjure up. Um, so again, this idea of the, the personal sort of journey and this sort of this point, this sort of future imagining of, of humanity's in, I think is very powerful. And I wanted to, in this show, kind of go back to this idea of the personal. That it wouldn't be me sort of telling people things, but just saying, okay, can I create these experiences that allow people to come to the show and then have this personal journey in each of the words about the topics that I'm trying to sort of discuss with the readers in, in, that, in those conversations? I think maybe in your uh, th that discussion about art, and that discussion about art and uh, technology and a, and a possible equivalence there, I mean, and perhaps it's a an, an obvious thought, but I think um, as uh, technology gets more demonic or as we use it in, in certain ways, it doesn't become less technological. I mean, I, I think Michael's right. I mean, I think it can be manipulated for, for good or for ill. In either direction, it maintains its essential identity as, as technology. It's some sort of form of enhancement. But I do think that there's a difference, and perhaps one that's a bit more humanizing with art, and I, I would worry about it with the equivalence, is that I, th I do think when art is used to, um, uh, in very sort of declarative ways, and it becomes too polemical, I think it, I think it tends to, it tends to deny itself as art, and it loses that multivalency. Um, and so there, is, so in terms of how each of these, how art and technology, how they, how they operate at their limit experiences, I think that's where we disclose a fundamental dissonance uh, between the two. That's what's so interesting with combining revelation with the technology is if there's ever a text which is multivalent, it's revelation, right? Like so many readings, so many different times. And combining that and having technology then being used to reread that, which is something very specific itself, it has that that real tension between what's going on with neutrality of art versus neutrality of technology in that multivalency. So I think that adds a really, such a unique um, experience for this exhibition, which I haven't seen in other revelations. Yeah, I like the point that Simon brought up about this being something, about um, turning things into code and then requiring technology to interpret that. Um, and to reveal itself. Um, I think that's it. And, and comparing that again to sort of antiquated things that we might encounter in the, uh, the British Museum, I think that's a nice, um, a nice way to, um, to think about how we're, how we're making things more lucid, we're, we're more empowering, and yet at the same time, each step of it, empowering and, and potency, is also just one switch away from utter impotency at the same time. I don't think that art is generally uh, neutral. Um, I think that Michael's made an effort here to make to make something which doesn't have his opinions in it. So I think that most 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 art through the centuries has been applied by people's opinions as well as as artistic vision. I think that the way that we look at art in the, in the past is often framed out of context. So for instance, we can look at um, Nazi war posters and look at them as historical objects. We can also look at them in 
has been evocative in a certain period of time, we can look at them really quite differently. But, I mean, that's obviously you know, naked, uh, nakedly political. But throughout the whole of history, with, Na with Natasha as well, she talk about the way that Jura and um, Lucas Cranach um, um, presented the papers as you know, the way that the revolution is. I just think it's, it's kind of ambiguous to say it's something. Yeah, perhaps not neutral, but, but I think um, ambivalence in that truth tends to uh, some sort of contestation. That, and it's not to say that things get resolved and end in neutrality, but that there's some multivocal, multivocal characteristic, I think, in, in good art. And that's true. And that's what, what is interesting is those test cases like Cronach is that when you are doing something that's so declarative and so pejorative and you're casting the Pope as. Um, uh, as this sort of archive and figure that, you know, that, and yet there, we can certainly say not just in its technical aptitude, but it still remains that it's, it's doing something that's interesting. It can still be approached from multiple angles. Yeah. Now it's just about tea time. Um, Michael, we did, I want to offer you the last word if there's anything else you want to say before we break for tea. But you, 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 your brains have been picked at various points so far and no doubt will be again after tea. So please come and help yourselves to a drink and uh, we're going to try and resume more formally in about 20 minutes, so we've got time to chat, refill your cups, and um, we'll, I'll call you back to order at 10 too.